Welcome to our video on finding the funicular shape for a compression member based on experimental methods. This video and the following two videos constitute a sequence of three videos focusing on the three common methods for finding the funicular shape of compression structures, such as arches, vaults, domes, etc. By funicular shape, we mean the shape that the structure should be given such that it will result in the structure being in pure axial compression stress with no bending stresses under the primary load. The primary load is typically gravity for a compression structure, particularly one that's heavy, such as one made out of masonry. Under all other loads, all loads other than the primary load, the shape will not be ideal and the structure will have to have some bending capacity to resist the bending moments induced by that load. We will talk about that more in later, vehicle, later videos. The three methods of form finding are experimental form finding, analytical form finding, and graphical form finding. The three methods of form find, the uh, three videos will repeat some of the subject matter in the preceding video, but take a more in-depth look at the subject matter. Each of the form finding methods addressed has situations where it is very elegant, meaning it is very simple, direct, and effective. Similarly, each method has situations where it is awkward, or very challenging to apply, so it is not the tool of choice in those situations. The focus of this video is on experimental methods of form finding. If this particular structure was made out of concrete and was very heavy compared to any snow load that might accumulate on it, then the primary load would be the self-weight of the structure, which is uniform along the curved form because the cross-section along the curved form is uniform and the density of the material is uniform. By definition, the funicular form for this arch would be the shape that would result in pure axial force in the arch with no bending moment to induce bending stresses. Finding the funicular form for this particular structure under that load is very easily accomplished using experimental modeling techniques. This tensile structure, which is a suspended bicycle chain, fits the criterion that its self-weight is uniform along the chain. Furthermore, by the nature of the chain, it can only resist axial tension along its length. It cannot resist any bending stresses. Therefore, it can only assume one shape, which is the funicular shape. In this particular situation, this shape is called a catenary. This chain can be suspended and allowed to assume its natural shape, which is a, a state which is in a pure state of tension. Then it can be turned upside down and it will have the perfect form to support its self weight in pure compression, as shown in this image. However, since it has many hinges, it will typically collapse if disturbed even slightly. In the case of this chain, the slight friction of all the joints did allow us to turn it upside down and have it support itself. If we glued the joints of the chain while it was hanging in the correct shape, it would make a very good arch when turned upside down because the previous pin joints would be moment joints. And that would produce the required stabilization for it to function as an arch. 
We do not typically construct buildings by suspending elements upside down, gluing them, and then flipping them over. So we have to generate coordinates and dimensions that will allow us to accurately construct the arch in its upright position at full scale. If our chain is very accurately made, and we can measure its shape very accurately, then we can scale up those measurements as a basis for constructing the building. However, it is usually even more challenging to do these very accurate measurements than to solve the transcendental equation to get the coordinates of the catenary arch using analytic modeling. The appropriate shape for a catenary is quite challenging to compute. That will be the subject of a later video. We rarely do a catenary in practice, so many of you will be satisfied to just have a general sense of what the word catenary means and to be aware that finding the catenary form is very easily is very easy experimentally and very challenging analytically or graphically. This image is provided to put the catenary shape in context. So this middle curve is the catenary, this outer curve is a semicircle, and the inner circle is a parabola. The parabola is of the form y equals kx squared, where x is the horizontal dimension measured from the center line in this direction and y is the vertical dimension. It's very simple mathematically. The catenary is extremely complex to determine. It's derived from a transcendental equation which is solved literally by trial and error. The load on this arch is uniform along the length of the arch. So in other words, every time we go one link along this chain, um, we've introduced the same dead weight or self weight as for the next link and the next link and the next link and so forth but it is not uniform as projected along the horizontal. So when somebody says a uniform load, the first question in your mind should be uh, uniform along what? Along the length of the, or along the curve, or along the horizontal. So in the center here, we've drawn two lines which go from one point on one of these links to the same point on the next link. So in essence, we've gone um, one link from one of these lines to the next. If we take these two lines and we move them or we copy them over here and we line them up, we see it's going from this pin on this link beyond that pin to the same pin on the next link. In other words, between these two lines, we have two full links, whereas between the two lines over here, we only have one full link. In other words, the load as projected down on the horizontal is twice as great between these two identically spaced lines as the load that's projected down to the horizontal for these two lines. So in other words, we have twice the load near the support points that we have near the center of the arch. In contrast to the preceding example, the broad gate exchange house is a structure for which the load is predominantly uniform along the horizontal. The arches on this building weigh less than 2% of the load they are carrying. And the load they're carrying is 10 stories of concrete slab floor, floor beams, and live load. 
And that load, by the way, is uniformly distributed along the horizontal line in this building. And the lo load is accumulating in these vertical elements, which are uniformly loaded. And those uniformly loaded vertical elements are being supported at these key intersections on the arch. So if we say the load of the floor slabs and the uniform live load and the beams is uniform along the horizontal, then the load on the arch is uniform along the horizontal. Again, these uniform loads on the floors are drastically larger than the self-weight of the arch. Therefore, to first order, we ignore the self-weight of the arch and focus on these other loads which are uniform as projected on the horizontal. In this case, these floor loads are delivered to the arch at the joints, which are equally spaced horizontally along the arch. As we will show in a subsequent video, the appropriate shape for this arch is a parabola and not a catenary. And the parabola is y equals kx squared. So, we have uniform load along the horizontal leads to the parabola, which we will prove analytically. Uniform load along the, along the curved member, in other words, along the arch, produces the catenary as the appropriate funicular shape. Um, that load on the horizontal is greater near the support points than it is near the center. And as a consequence, the catenary tends to bulge out a bit more than the parabola because it has a more a larger load in this zone here, and it's resisting that larger load by bulging outward to meet the load. So it, the catenary has to bulge a little more near the supports, or in other words, to be fuller in form to respond to the higher loads there. And it can be relatively flatter near the center of the arch. As in the case of the catenary, we can find the appropriate shape for the broad gate exchange house arch using an experimental method involving the tensile analog. In the case of the catenary, the solution is arrived at instantaneously by suspending a simple tension member like a rope or chain under its own weight. In the case of the Broadgate Exchange House, the process would be a tedious process of trial and error. Symbolically, this image shows the tensile analog of the Broadgate Exchange House, showing the extremely uniform spacing of the load along the horizontal. We could find the appropriate shape by trial and error, hanging the weights in various positions along the suspension member until the final form in, yields a situation where the weights line up in a row with precisely equal spacing along the horizontal. This is what that exercise produces after many profoundly frustrating iterations. Every time you shift a weight, you change the shape of everything, and it's very difficult to find a systematic method that leads you ultimately to a situation where all these elements are uniformly spaced along the horizontal. But we want you to notice the uniform spacing of these washers, the uniform spacing of these suspender elements. Also note how well the suspension elements, the element lines up with the curve drawn in the background. So look at this suspender and then look at the curve in the background. The curve in the background is the shape determined by the analytic solution to this problem. 
in the case of this problem, the process of analytic form finding much, much easier than the method of experimental form finding. However, historically, this method of trial and error on the tensile analog has been incredibly effective and productive, particularly before the advent of the computer. Gaudi created incredibly complex masonry compression structures, which would have collapsed if their, head, if their shape had deviated slightly from the funicular shape. All of Gaudi's structures were developed based on the trial and error method applied to the tensile analog of the compression structure that he was designing. So here you'll notice a shape that looks like a dome, and that's in fact what it's going to end up being. But these are tensile members, and slowly but surely he went in and adjusted the distribution of these tension members and also the size of the tension members so that he could simulate the shape that he was after, generally speaking, and also he would know how thick to make the vault. So all of his work was based on this tensile analog from which he took very accurate measurements of the dimensions of things and subsequently generated the geometry for the compression structure, which is basically this tensile structure flipped upside down. Gothic cathedrals were also based on the experimental method. We're not sure about whether they used the tensile analog, but we do know that the designer builders of Gothic cathedrals fabricated and honed blocks of compression models where the stability of the structure was tested by stacking the blocks and pressing laterally on the structure to test how well it was balanced and how stable it was under horizontal forces of wind, similar to this model. This arch demonstrates the property of self-restoration, which the builders of Gothic cathedrals would have been looking for. In the case of this arch, it was possible to repeatedly press the structure inward or to the side, and it would snap back to its original shape, which looks like this. This process is very effective in producing the optimal shape under gravity loads, particularly under the self-weight of the masonry structure itself, but it does not account for effects of stress and buckling at the larger scale of the actual building. As a result of this incomplete knowledge of structural behavior, many Gothic cathedrals collapsed during construction. Because of uncertainties in the behavior of these structures, it became a part of our modern building code that you could not build an unreinforced masonry structure of this sort legally in the 20th century. In the modern age, we have some people who are interested in resurrecting unreinforced masonry structures uh, because we now have very sophisticated computer techniques that will not only give us indications of how stable they are, but will also predict issues of stress failure and buckling of the structure. However, under severe seismic effects, there are still questions about the merits of this idea, but at least we have reasonable expectations that we in the modern age could build a Gothic cathedral and not expect it to collapse under its own weight before the construction is completed. This concludes our video on using experimental methods to determine the funicular shape 
for compression structures.